When you try and understand how modern CPUs and GPUs work, you're just staring at a world of complexity. In the last video, I wrote a program that mimicked the way that we divide numbers by two or multiply numbers by two. It really came down to these five lines of code inside the while loop. The big reveal in the last video was that these five lines of code are all that's required to play Apple II Pac-Man. The code that draws the pixels doesn't actually participate in the computation. This is still be running whether I draw the pixels or not. Why do we care about old microprocessors like the 6502 found in the Apple II? Well, the data buses might be a lot wider, but the common instructions we use to program these machines hasn't changed that much. The idea behind this video series is to learn the basic principles behind these early microprocessors, which can then be applied to more modern CPUs. One of the most important concepts is that of the Turing machine, which was invented by this person, Alan Turing. Another important concept is the Church Turing thesis, which also bears his name. Now, there's no such thing as a physical implementation of a pure Turing machine. For one thing, a Turing machine has infinite memory. This is an approximation of a Turing machine, which has enough memory to emulate a 6502 microprocessor. This can also be implemented with wires and silicon chips. And I was going to build this machine in this video, but I'll delay it to the next video. There's another important concept I want to go over first. I want to briefly revise how this code works. This program was pretty straightforward. It had two data structures, a notepad, which is where we did the arithmetic, and a rule book, which told us how to manipulate the numbers that we saw on the notepad. The inner loop for the algorithm was pretty straightforward. We'd read a symbol from the notepad. We then use that with our current rule to look up the next rule. We'd write a new symbol over the symbol that was already there on the notepad. We'd move one position left or one position right on the notepad. And then finally, we'd make the next rule the current rule. And we just put this in an infinite loop. You might be thinking to yourself, well, I've seen the design for the 6502, and it has an arithmetic logic unit. It has an A register and a B register, which feed the ALU. The ALU feeds the status register. And we haven't even got into the memory addressing scheme, like the program counter, the address bus registers, which are actually called memory address registers in most other architectures. And we haven't got onto the index X, index Y, or stack pointer yet. And what about the accumulator and the instruction register? Honestly, where are any of these structures in these five lines of code that are playing Pac-Man? And I know the 6502 uses these features. You might even argue that you've used the add, subtract, and, or, XOR, and other logical and arithmetic instructions yourself. You might even say, I've looked at other emulators, like Apple Win, and that contains hundreds, if not thousands, of lines of code. To which my response is, OK, let's look at some of these features inside the 6502. We have the A register and the B register, which are actually both hidden from the user, but these are used to feed the ALU. And then down to the left, we have the status register. Well, it is possible to emulate all of these with just these lines of code. Let's take a look at the notepad, which is just a large one-dimensional array of bytes. Essentially, it's the same as a memory chip. In this case, I'm only going to use four symbols, underscore, zero, one, and dollar. So I'm actually only using two bits of every location in the notepad. Starting at location zero on the left, let's say this just happens to be the data stored on the notepad. I've put the dollar symbol on a blue background, but that's just to make things a bit clearer. In reality, it's just another symbol. I get to control what's on the notepad, so I'm going to use these double dollar symbols on the far left to indicate the start of the tape. I may use the terms tape and notepad interchangeably here, but Turing in his paper referred to it as a tape. To the right of the double dollars, I'm going to leave space for eight symbols, and I'm going to have these represent my status register. This is just really setting aside some space on the notepad for where I want to store the status register. It's up to me to make sure I use it properly. 
Further down the tape, I'm going to set aside space for eight symbols, which I'm going to call the B register. Just left of the B register is space for another eight symbols, which I'm going to call the A register. And these will store the same information that would be held in the equivalent registers in the design. Given what's currently stored on the notepad, A has the value of 5A hexadecimal, and B has the value of 29 hexadecimal. And while I've called them registers, it's probably more accurate to call them variables, especially given the fact that they're stored in a variable called notepad. And these variables are just abstract representations of the registers on the real 6502. For all of these variables, I've chosen to put the most significant bit on the left and the least significant bit on the right, but I could have just as easily done it the other way round. Without a lot of effort, I can actually make it so that the simulation uses these four ASCII characters, underscore, zero, one, and dollar. This has absolutely no impact on the inner loop for the code for the Turing machine. I'll run it again. When it stops at this breakpoint, we can zoom in and literally inspect the notepad. We can see the double dollar at the start, the status register. The A and the B register might look a bit odd at the moment, but hopefully it'll make more sense by the end of the video. In fact, I'll go over it now. If we look at A and B in their current form, this is all good and well and it looks very neat, but it's actually not in its most usable form. So I'm going to do something a little tricky now, move things about, and it should be apparent a bit later why I've done this. What I want to do is interleave the values of the A register and the B register variables. Again, it's up to me to define what the meaning of each of these boxes is. So if I want to put A0 next to B0 and A7 next to B7, I can, it's my call. So now all the bits of A are interleaved with all the bits of B, but they're all lined up, so they're effectively occurring in pairs. In this code fragment, A holds the value 1, 0 hexadecimal, and B is empty. If we go back to our code, the rule book's defined up the top, but there's actually a far more intuitive way to represent this information and thus to represent it graphically. We represent each rule by a circle with a number on the inside. This number is the rule number, and in this case it defines what rule 204 is. The circle has an arrow pointing out of it for every possible symbol on the tape. In this case, underscore, zero, one, and dollar. These are called arcs, and we can add extra information to the arc. Here I've got a symbol, followed by an arrow, then another symbol. The first symbol is what I found on the notepad at our current location, and the second symbol is what I want to write over the top of the first symbol. So if I happen to be in rule 204 and I see the underscore, then I write a zero over the top of it. Similarly, if I see a zero, then I write a dollar over the top of it. If I see a one, then I write back a one, and if I see a dollar, I write back the underscore. Another piece of information I need to know at each arc is whether to move left or right over the notepad. So this should read, in rule 204, if I see an underscore, write a zero and move left. And if I see a zero, write the dollar and move right. The final piece of information I need per arc is which rule to move to next. Here, if I'm in rule 204 and I see a one on the tape, I write back one. I move left over the tape and go to rule 205. Every arc needs a next rule to move to, but it can actually loop back onto itself, and this is often quite useful. How do these diagrams correlate with what's in the data structure? The underscore arc out of rule 204 can be assigned with this code. And the same is true for all the other arcs coming out of rule 204. In the divide by two example, I did exactly this and used code to assign the values in the rulebook. In the Pac-Man example though, the entire rulebook was read in from pre-computed values on disk. Let's go back to our example and assume that we start in rule 205 and that our notepad point is here, as indicated by the red arrow. I'm gonna add my own labels to these rules, but they're really just for my benefit. The labels are sum equals zero, no carry, sum equals one, carry, and sum equals two. 
So the first thing I do is read the notepad, which contains a 1, and then I look for an arc out of rule 205 that has a 1 on it. Look at that. I just found one. This says, write an underscore, move left on the notepad, and go to rule 206. So I do that, and now I move to rule 206 and start with a new notepad location. I read the notepad. It contains a 0. So I look for an arc containing a zero out of rule 206. And how lucky am I? I just found one. As this says, write a one, move left, and go to rule 205. This time, I read a zero off the notepad, and now I need to find an arc containing a zero out of rule 205. And there we go. I write an underscore, move left, and go to rule 204. Now I see a one. I find an arc for that. This tells me to write a 1, go left, and move to rule 205. Now in rule 205, I see a 0, and an arc for 0 is already there. I follow this, which tells me to write an underscore, move left, and go to rule 204. But this time in rule 204, I see a 0. Now I could draw another arc out of rule 204, but I want to go to rule 205. So instead of adding a new arc from rule 204 to 205, I'm just going to add another label to the existing arc. If I see a 0, I use the upper label, and if I see a 1, I use the lower label. So on this occasion, I'm going to replace the 0 with a 0, move left, and go to rule 205. I keep doing this until I find myself in rule 206 with a 1 written on the notepad. Don't forget that it's me who's defining what all of these arcs are. So I'm choosing what happens at rule 206. We continue this process until our tape pointer lands on the dollar symbol. This means we've finished and we need to do something else. I'm going to add another arc for the dollar symbol and that'll take us to rule 209. Let's examine what's happened to our tape in this process. We started with 5A and 29 in A and B respectively. And at the end of the process, A contains 8, 3, and B contains underscores, which means it's clear. If we pull out our handy hexadecimal calculator, we can see that 5A plus 2, 9 equals 8, 3. How about that? This simple set of rules performs a bit sequential addition. Change the rules a little bit. And we can do subtraction with carry. Logic operations are even simpler, and they're all very similar. And, or, and let's not forget exclusive or. All of these instructions impact the flags, so let's look at XOR in a bit more detail. At each bit position, it compares B against A. If they're the same, it writes a zero into A. And if they're different, it writes a 1. It always writes an underscore into B. No information is transferred between the bit pairs, so the outcome of A0 and B0 has no impact on A1 and B1. If we look at the data sheet for the 6502, we can see that the exclusive OR operation impacts the negative flag and the zero flag. In this last example, the A register was left with 83 hex in it, which means that the negative flag should be set and the zero flag should be cleared. Let's see if I can build a machine that sets the flags appropriately. I'm going to create a new arc out of rule 245 for when I hit the dollar symbol. I want to write the dollar back, move right, and go to rule 300. Now I'm reading the value in A7. If it's one, it means that it's negative and not zero. In this case, it is one, so I just write the one back and step left. Now I need to skip over the dollar symbol and over the value in the carry flag. This takes me to rule 303 with the notepad pointer over the zero flag. So now I just write zero irrespective of what was there before. Now I want to skip to the end of the status register. So I'm going to make an arc out of rule 304 that loops back to itself. If I find an underscore, zero or one, I just write the same value back over the top and move left. And I keep doing this until I find the dollar symbol. 
In fact, this is the real utility of the dollar symbol. It lets me just keep moving over the data until I'm at a known point. Once I do reach the dollar symbol, I go to rule 305, and this places me over the top of the negative flag. And while I do read the information that was there, I essentially ignore it and just write a 1 no matter what. Then after that, I move to an end instruction machine. That's all good and well, but what if the value in the A register had been 3 instead of 83? This time, I want the negative flag and the zero flag both to be zero. I step to rule 300 as I did before, but because I read zero on the notepad, I go down a different arc to rule 306. And this time, I step right instead of stepping left. Now, rule 306 has two arcs which feed back into itself, one for underscore and one for zero. And what it means is the machine will continue to go right until it finds either a one or a dollar symbol. Let's fast forward this a bit. The machine sees the one on the tape and goes to rule 307. Rule 307 has an arc that leads back into itself. And so it'll just skip over underscores, zeros, and ones, and wait until it finds a dollar symbol. We want to skip past the dollar symbol and skip past the carry flag. Now that we're at the zero flag, we read it, but we ignore that and just write a zero. We skip to the dollar just to the left of the negative flag. Then we come back one position and we write zero into the negative flag. Now let's examine the case where the A register holds zero after the XOR. This time we want the N flag to be zero and the zero flag to contain a one. We go down to rule 306, but this time we step across all the data until we hit the dollar symbol. Once that happens, we follow a different arc out of rule 306 to 312. From here, we keep stepping left until we hit another dollar symbol. We step over the dollar symbol and the carry flag, and then we write a 1 into the zero flag. We keep stepping left until we hit the dollar symbol. Then we move right one position and write zero into the negative flag. I'm going to call this the update NZ machine. I removed my Kiwi joke that was just here. This upper pathway is for when the value in the A register is negative. The middle pathway is for when the value in the A register is neither negative nor zero. Finally, we follow the bottom pathway if the value in the A register is zero. Now the really cool thing is, I can add this update NZ machine to both the AND and the OR operations. There's more to emulating a 6502 instruction than I've shown here. Von Neumann architectures like the 6502 are constantly going through this fetch, decode, execute loop. And what I've shown thus far really only constitutes part of the execute phase. However, I did want to give you a bit of a taste as to how this simple code can emulate a 6502. In the next video, I'll turn this code into hardware. It's very satisfying seeing something as simple as this emulate the 6502. You may be wondering, if it's that easy, then why did they go to the effort of building such a complex system? Well, the simplest design isn't always the most efficient design, and the original 6502 has far fewer transistors than the machine I've built. It's a trade-off, and the original design obviously hit the price performance sweet spot. But as an external viewer, it does take a little while to get a handle on this design. I've always felt there's been a bit of a gap between what's taught in foundations of computing classes and what's taught in computer architecture classes. The purpose of this channel is to try to bridge that gap. So don't forget, like, share, and subscribe.